factors because that's how they're going to test that. Excellent. Okay. Yes, sir. Okay, respiratory microbe. Um, starting with the nose, of course, uh, we can have things like rhinitis, um, rhinitis, uh, sinusitis, right? Pharyngitis, upper respiratory infection, laryngitis, epiglottitis. Okay, let's take them one by one. Rhinitis, inflammation of the nose. How would that present? Sneezing. Uh, rhinorrhea, the nasal, nasal mucosa will be erythematous and edematous and bogey and swollen. And sometimes rhinitis can occur alone or can occur together with what sinusitis. In that case, called what rhinosinusitis. Yes. How will I know somebody has sinusitis now? Tenderness of the what? Of the sinuses. So, papi is mm -hmm. over the maxillary sinus, papi is over the frontal sinus. Exmoidal sinus is here. Yeah. And if those areas are tender, then we know that our patient has what? Sinusitis. Sinusitis. So rhinosinusitis. Rhinodia, uh, pressure on the face. Sometimes they're going to tell you the pressure on the face is high when they lie down, right? Yeah. So this is going to tell you likely sinusitis. Tenderness about the sinus, sinusitis. If it's just the nose that is inflamed, the sinuses are not tender, they're just rhinitis. Yeah. The most Common cause of rhinosinusitis is what? Viruses. Okay. And that's why most cases are what? Supportive treatment. Mm -hmm. Right? And yes. here's the thing, and this is something your exam wants, likes to do. They're going to tell you that what? The mucus, the rhinorrhea is what? Purulent. It doesn't mean it's bacterial. <laughs> do you get what I mean? It's still virus. <laughs> right? So they're going to put it there. They're going to tell you, opinion is rhinosinusitis. But I don't tell you the mucus is purulent. So what? <laughs> most likely cause will still be viral. No matter what, whether the mucus is purulent or not, most likely cause will still be viral sinusitis. Yeah. <laughs> now, what are gonna be clues that will tell you for sure that this is bacterial, rhinosinusitis, sinusitis, is the duration. Viruses are self-limiting infection. Viruses are resolved within three days. Mm -hmm. Tops gone, but somebody is having persistent rhinosinusitis for a week. Ah, no, it's no more virus, bacteria now at that point. Okay, yeah. The duration is more specific to separate viral rhinosinusitis from bacterial rhinosinusitis. So, rhinosinusitis that is persistent for more than three years, sometimes for a week, seven days. In eight days, 10 days, okay. Now you're thinking most likely now it's not a virus, it's a bacteria rhinosinusitis at that point. Or they now have what? High grade fever. I won't say high grade fever, just viral. Yeah, mm -hmm. high grade fever, likely bacteria. We check that WBC is high and we see differential show what? Neutrophils burn cells is likely bacteria. Excellent. Yes, sir. Okay. At this level, we're interested in what box. So, I mean, they can ask me. They give me a patient with rhinosinusitis. Uh, rhinosinusitis is, is within three days symptoms or less than three days. We're thinking it's viral. They can ask you the most likely box, right? Yeah, it's like rhinovirus, right? Rhinovirus, yes, adenovirus. Yeah. Just are gonna be influenza doesn't cause rhinosinusitis, right? Influenza doesn't no. cause that, right? So typically, um, uh, actually, patient doesn't have systemic feature. They don't have joint pain, muscle pain, uh, prostration, those kind of things. Gonna be just in like right, uh, right, uh, rhinovirus, adenovirus, uh, some coronavirus, right? Those can cause rhino, right? Sinusitis. So we want to know those viruses. Know their about molecular and um, their structure. Yes, know the actually for rhinovirus. No, the structure because of COVID yes, coronavirus. No, the structure of coronavirus. I didn't get. I know all those are RNA viruses. All of them are RNA viruses. Corona is illico, illico, um, illico RNA virus, and it has what envelope, right? It's enveloped, enveloped illico RNA virus. I think single-stranded, yeah, for, yeah, it's single-stranded RNA virus. 
to corona rhinovirus i think rhino t is rhino is naked but it i think it's illegal i'm not sure so but i have an idea of their structure that they can ask you that's what they're gonna do this is basics right that's what they're gonna ask you not just the name yes. of them so okay okay what about bacterial rhinosinusitis bacterial rhinosinusitis most common organisms are what strep pneumonia Hemophilus influenza, Moraxella cataralis. Strep Nemo, Hemophilus influenza, they the non type of strains, the ones that the vaccine doesn't cover, and uh, Moraxella cataralis, those are the most common bacterial causes, right, of rhinosinusitis. And those three, too, coincidentally, also cause what? Otitis media. Most common bacteria mm -hmm. with otitis media. Those three bugs. So you have to know their structure, especially what strep pneumon. <laughs> we have to know the microbiology. Strep is a strep. It's a cocax, right? So cocars, mm -hmm. which is secular, is gram positive bug and is catalyst negative. Streps are catalyst negative, staffs are catalyst positives. Yeah, all staffs are catalyst positive, but streps are catalyst negative. So, streptococcus cause catalyst negative bug, it is gram positive cocci, and um, uh, it's in chains, right? Streptococcus. And um, so, uh, pneumonia is uh, the hemolytic pattern for strep pneumonia is, uh, is the beta alpha, alpha hemolytic. In other words, it does not completely break down red blood cell. If you if you culture strep pneumonia in a blood agar, it's alpha incomplete hemolysis. You're gonna see green uh, pattern hemolysis, not yellow. Yellow will be complete hemolysis, or clear hemolysis will be complete hemolysis. Green will be, I think, green or yellow will be incomplete. I think so alpha for strep pneumonia, and then it is up to chin, uh, I think, sensitive. Yeah. The gene sensitive. That's how it's separated from the counterpart, which is a uh, very dense group. Yeah. So, yeah, optician sensitive, it is the uh, alpha immunity, that's incomplete immunity, immunolysis, optician sensitive, the gram positive, right? In chains, cocaine chains, right? So, we gotta know the biology, histology, right? For strep pneumonia, microbiology education, it's super high but All right, so the Marazia Catara is a gram negative uh, rod. No, gram negative cocci. Uh, each influenza is a gram negative rod. Okay, so that's rhinosinusitis, uh, sinusitis. Then we go down to the pharynx. Pharyngitis. How would pharyngitis present? Pharyngitis, how would that present? And dark swollen tonsils, exudates or no exudates. Okay, so erythematous tonsils or pharynx, pharyngeal erythema, tonsils erythema, sometimes exudates will be there or not. And um, also, patients will present with like, like sutures, right? As chief complaints, right? Things like that. Pharyngitis can be complicated by what? By peritonsillar abscess as well as retropharyngeal abscess. So sometimes, right, is a bacteria, actually it's caused by bacteria, right? A, a bacteria, uh, caused by bacteria. So it can come here by peritonsillar abscess. If you, in that case, you're gonna see what division of the uvula. Somebody has pharyngitis, how do you know that they have abscess around the tonsils? The uvula in the main line will not be in the main line, it's gonna be deviated. So then you're thinking of peritonsillar abscess. Or if they tell you they have severe difficulty swallowing, severe neck pain, all those kind of things, they may have a retropharyngeal abscess. It's kind of involved going to the retropharyngeal space. And after the retropharyngeal space, we have, we have the vertebra. So sometimes they can go all the way back, the patient can extend all the way back to the world, vertebra canal, and this is epidural abscess. At that point, now patient will have evidence of spinal cord compression here. So these are going to be possible complications, right? Of pharyngeal because of the anatomic continu continuity on the pharynx. If I go to the back, I pharyngeal space. After that, I'm going to the vertebra, right? The bone yes, of the spinal column, and then we have the spinal cord there, right? So sometimes you can go all the way back there 
and this is this kind of complications here. Yeah. These are possible complications from pharyngitis. Uh, this feature with the retropharyngeal. And what was the one for the spinal cord again? Epidural abscess. Okay. Okay. So now, patient, we have a feature of spinal cord compression, right? So, neurologic symptoms, uh, weakness, upper motor neuron lesion, loss of sensation below the left, right, of the lesion. Yes, sir. Mm, okay. Uh, organism wise, pharyngitis, we have viruses that can cause pharyngitis. And we have what? Um, bacteria, right? Pharyngitis. So basically, notable virus will be what? Influenza, right? Virus. The thing with influenza virus, viral pharyngitis is what is uh, it's, uh, it's, that causes the flu is that what? The nature of this pharyngitis, what do you see? You see systemic manifestations. They have okay. high fever, they have what? Myalgia, muscle pain, joint mm -hmm. pain. These people just want to what? They just want to lie down. They can't walk around. Severe prostration and severe fatigue, dehydration, right? Yeah, like the flu, okay? And stop the okay. nose, post nasal drip, all those kind of things. Yeah, all right. But another cause of pharyngitis is what? Um, mononucleosis, right? Infectious mm -hmm. mononucleosis, kissing disease, which is caused by which viruses? Epsom And? Mm -hmm. EPV and CMV. CMV too can cause CMV. infectious mononucleosis, right? Okay. How do I tell them apart? EBV is what as heterophil right test for the heterophil antibody, which are antibodies yes. that can also react with what other not just red blood cells in the in humans that can react with what red blood cells in animals like sheep. So if you take the patient's serum, you add it to the sheep's blood, you're gonna see coagulation of the sheep's blood, right? Which means they have antibodies that can react with what with order. That's why I got heterophil. Multiple love for fuel. Hetero means multiple, right? Not just affinity for human red blood cells, also affinity for animal red blood cells like sheep's red blood cells. So the heterophil antibody tends to be positive in EBV, mononucleosis, but negative in what CMV, right? Mononucleosis, yeah. Okay. Or sometimes they can tell you that well, we check anti EBV antibodies. So that will also tell me this is the EBV, or anti CMV antibodies will be positive if it's CMV, right? Mononucleosis, right? Yeah. And then those books still are important. We gotta know their uh, structure. Yes, sir. EBV and CMV are part of the human, right? Epis viruses. Mm -hmm. And in my viruses, there are DNA viruses. DNA. Double stranded yes. DNA viruses. And they have enveloped. Enveloped double stranded DNA viruses. Yeah. So we gotta know that. And what other features will I see in mononucleosis? Besides the pharyngitis, the lymphadenopathy on the neck, what else will I see in mononucleosis? Mm. They can have what? Splenomegaly and large spleen. Yes. The yeah, liver the can be involved. Spots. Hepatitis, right? Splenomegaly, mm. hepatitis. I'm going to see that. Mononucleosis, yes. Mm. And if you check their labs, you're gonna see what you see leukocyte uh, lymphocytosis. Lymphocytes will be high. Which cells does EBV infect? Which lymphocyte do they infect? B cells. B cells. Which lymphocyte yes. will react to EBV infected B cells? T cells. T-cells. Yes, T-cells. Right. So you're going to see lymphocytosis in the WBC in patients with mononucleosis. The lymphocytes will be high. Uh, lymphocyte differentials will be high. But those lymphocytes are what? They are T-cells. They are reactive T-cells. T-cells reacting to what? The infected B-cells. T-cells trying to destroy the infected B-cells. 
Now we can see them also on peripheral blood stain, like they, they call them downy cells, right? Or atypical T cells, atypical lymphocytes. Actually, T cells are trying to react, right? To the infected, they are B cells, yeah? Yes, sir. How many cases? And like you mentioned, those people were well, mostly viral supportive treatment, but they, they have to avoid right contact spot, right? To decrease the risk of splenic rupture. Yeah. Yes. And this is common you were in people that are living in close quarters, right? College students, you see, right? The major recruits, barracks, because of respiratory droplets and stuff. Yes. So that's good. Yes, sir. Bacterial pharyngitis, what bug can cause bacterial pharyngitis? Diphtheria. Pharyngitis, okay, yeah. Diphtheria, chronic bacterial diphtheria can cause bacterial yes. pharyngitis. What do I see in diphtheria pharyngitis that's unique? Uh, that that green exactly the greenish right membrane in the pharynx right and it's going to be likely seen with unvaccinated right individual I'm also going to have what they're going to have diffuse in the party so their neck looks swollen because of swollen lymph nodes the bull's neck right yeah appearance something like that yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's a very important diffuse, a very party. We have the grayish membrane covering the pharynx. Yeah, and typically patients are unvaccinated. Yes, get that. Diphtheria is a gram positive rod, pleomorphic rod. It has different shapes and size. And I think it's motile. Yeah, but it's a gram positive rod. And another thing, what do they love about diphtheria? It makes toxin. Oh my God, that makes it high yield. It makes it toxin. That makes it high yield already. The fact that it makes toxin, oh my, you're gonna see it in your exam, or they're gonna ask about it, and they're gonna ask about the toxin. How does the toxin work? That'll be the question. Diphtheria toxin, how they're gonna give me diphtheria and tell me which bug also has the same, also has a toxin that works the same way. <laughs> so that's another question there for diphtheria. So diphtheria and pseudomonas. They, they are toxins work the same way. The exotoxin yeah. A of pseudomonas and the diphtheria toxin, they work the same way. And how do they work? They work by what adding ADP ribose. They take AD, they take ATP molecule. They, they are, their toxins are, is an enzyme. It's gonna take ADP, uh, ATP molecule, remove one of the phosphates, and take what yes. ADP ribose. And had it towards to eukaryotic elongation factor two, which is a factor we need for for translation in our cells. So the toxins of diphtheria and pseudomonas is an ADP ribose transferase enzyme. It takes ADP ribose, adds it to EF two, elongation factor two, and we and that will inhibit what translation protein synthesis in cells. Yes. So if, it, if the toxin is released in the world, in the pharynx, right, it's gonna kill those cells there lead to that gray pseudomembrane. Sometimes diphtheria toxin can do what? It can enter the blood. And neurons and cardiac muscles have what? They have receptor for diphtheria toxins. So cardiac muscles, and the nerves, they have receptor for diphtheria toxins. So if diphtheria toxin enters the blood, it goes to the heart, goes to the neurons, and what will you see additional to the pharyngitis? You're gonna say what? They can have cardiomyopathy, heart failure, or arrhythmias, or as well as peripheral neuropathy, weakness, loss of sensation because of the nerves being affected. Mm. So diphtheria high yield. What that? Mm. 
the toxin of pseudomonas, although it works the same way, it typically affects the liver. The receptor for the pseudomonas toxin is in the liver, so that goes to the liver and damages the liver, uh, prevents protein stasis in there. All right, but they work the same way. Okay, still on fine bacterial pharyngitis now. We have what group A strep, strep pyogenes, yeah, yeah. another high yield bug, for example. Group A strep, strep pyogenes. Mm -hmm. What is this uh, microbiology explanation of group A strep? Well, we know it's a streptococcus, so it's a gram positive co uh, cocus. That will be catalyst negative. It's going to be what? It has alpha hemolysis. Alpha hemolysis, I'm yeah, sorry, not alpha, beta. Ah, beta. Beta hemolysis, beta, 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 not alpha. Alpha is incomplete hemolysis. That will be what? Strep pneumonia and viridans. And then I separate them by what? Optochin uh, sensitive pneumonia, optochin resistant viridans. Right. And then for the beta hemolysis, what complete hemolysis. Those ones, if you yes, grow them in the uh, in blood agar, they'll be complete, right? Uh, break down blood cells. You're gonna know, see clearing, clear, uh, uh, send, uh, cl peri uh, organism clearing. There'll be complete clearing of the blood surrounding, right? The organism. Yeah, that'll be what strep pyogenes and that group A strep and group B strep. Strep pyogenes and uh, agalactyl. Those are beta hemolytic, complete hemolysis. Now you separate the American and what drug sensitivity, right? Pacitracin. So B for beta hemolysis, B for pacitracin. Pacitracin sensitive will be what? Uh, um, pyogenes. Pacitracin resistant will be what? Egalatia. You got it? Yes, sir. Let me confirm that though. And this pacitracin, sometimes I forget which one is resistant. Which one is uh, sensitive? Okay. All right. Yeah. All right. So, yeah. So, by uh sensitive, right? Um, um, group, um sorry, the group A strep, right? Uh, pyogenes resistance will be group B strep, right? In galaxy. Yeah. All right. So, yes. pyogenes supra not the structure. Now, pharyngitis this is one that causes what bacteria pharyngitis or strep throat. The famous strep throat is DB uh, group A strep, group A strep pyogenes. Yes. And um, so, what does the exam love about this guy? What do you love about this guy? It's not just, the, it's not actually the pharyngitis itself, right? Because pharyngitis is so what? What does boss cause pharyngitis? What I love about this guy is well, what it causes, right? After pharyngitis, mm -hmm. which is what? The rheumatic fever yes. and post strep nephritis. Oh. That's what they love about this book. So patient has strep throat two weeks ago, and today the patient is presenting with what? New heart murmur, evidence of heart failure, uh, chorea, sedentum chorea, erythema marginatum, erythema nodosum, migratory arthritis. Uh, it was most likely diagnosis, rheumatic fever now, complicating, right? The previous, right, or recent strep infection. Yes, sir. What is the mechanism of rheumatic fever? Oh, I know it's antigenic mimicry. The Molecular mimicry. What does that mean? Yeah, what does that mean? So the... the Myocardial sites have the same receptors, or they look the same. Something about it looks the same. Dog. Two, like same as what? Mm -hmm. So, strep pyogenes has what? It shares the same antigens as normal tissues in the body. 
Yes, sir. So, but just as the same antigens that you're going to find on some normal tissues in the body, like what? The heart, cardiac muscles, the endocardium, right? Where the brain, um, cells in the brain, neurons in the brain, skin, joints. So, what will happen to, what will happen to that patient? Patient has strep infection. What would the immune system do to the strep? They make antibodies against it, right? To destroy it. Yes, sir. Will they succeed? Yes, they'll succeed. So the pharyngitis will resolve. Mm -hmm. And then what will happen later? Those antibodies that will not do what start binding to what the antigens on the normal tissues in the body. Yes, sir. And that will lead to what? Disruption of those tissues, invasion of those tissues, and what? Which is rheumatic fever. What type of high percentage reaction is that? This is a tissue that will be type 2. Type 2. Type yes. 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 What is the mechanism of post strep in an epidemic? Strep. I think it's immune complex deposition. Immune mm -hmm. complex. Yes, absolutely. So the immune system attacks strep, strep pneumonia. They are, they are attacking or they make antibodies against what soluble antigens of the mm -hmm. organism, like the double stranded DNA and whatever else the organism has, and strep lysine and those antigens are soluble. They are in the blood. The make antibodies against them, the antibodies will bind to those antigens that are in the blood and form what the immune complex is. And these kidneys will irritate those immune complexes, and those complexes will get trapped in the world, in the glomerulus and trigger what inflammation of the glomerulus and into what the nephritis. Yes, Excellent. Yes, excellent. If rheumatic fever, if somebody has to be current rheumatic fever, what can that lead to complication wise? Somebody is having endocarditis, pancarditis, chronically, every time, the current multiple episodes. What will happen to the endocardium and the valves in the heart? Fibrosis, sir. Fibrosis, so yes. the valves. They will be uh, oh, stenosed. Yes. They become stenosed. We then I can have what? Mitral valve stenosis, aortic valve stenosis, right? As a complication, right? Of the current rheumatic fever. So. And that's what we call rheumatic heart disease. Okay. Right? Yeah. Yes, sir. Okay. Pyogenes can also cause other infections outside the respiratory system, right? Can cause the lightings. There is a palace in the tiger, scarlet fever, right? Yeah. So you can call yes. the right? Infection outside, respiratory, pandemic, uh, right? So that's important. Okay. Um, epiglottitis caused by what? No, we not hearing you clearly. Epiglottitis is caused by? Epiglottitis. Mm -hmm. uh, it's influenza. Right, most common cause of influenza. Right. Right. Most common because of H influenza. The type B, right? The type that the one that has what the capsule. Right. H influenza type B. It's the one that we have in the vaccine, right? 
I was trying to protect the game, right? The vaccine, yes, so yeah. So thank you. Yes. A protest strain of each and every one. All right. No, that's wait, I'm not. No, I'm not hearing you clearly. You sound far away. Can you hear me better? That is all. Better? Yes, sir. Better. Okay. So the egg, the cups is the most right important violence factor right for the influenza. The cups will be the most important violence factor for the influenza. All right. So just like all most encapsulated strep and dengue, the cups is the most important violence factor. Yeah, for the drugs. Would be at risk for encapsulated box. Mm, someone who doesn't have a spleen. So, spleen patients, patients are not vaccinated, right? Spleen patients can be traumatic spleen after trauma is therapeutic or treating conditions like sclerosis or uh, ITP. It may also be what is sickle cell disease, right? Or the spleenectomy, right? The sickle cell disease. Yeah, so this will be that for end of the table, right? Thank you. How will epiglottitis prevent? Ooh. That they have strider. Um, mm -hmm. right. like barking cough. Mm, barking cough, not epiglottitis. That is true. Oh, yeah, that's true. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Barking cough. So, epiglottitis, they can swallow. They can have, they are pulling up saliva away in their mouth. True. But they can not swallow, they can be drooling. They open their mouth, you see, pulling of what? Uh, food, right? Their mouth. Pulling of saliva in their mouth. Yes, yeah, they can swallow coffee, pulling of saliva in their mouth. Hot little boys. Yeah, or huh? Hot potato, right? Boys. Mm. Yeah, they can't talk properly. Okay, yes, sir. Try to do the positive breathing. They have the trap, they are doing the tripod position, right? For a child. They're going to put, sit up, extend their neck, right? So they're gasping for air and put their hand, right, on their knee, right? That's a tripod position. Those are pictures of like severe distress, right? Extreme distress, right? Yeah. They are going to have high grade fever, they may be hypotensive, right? Massive leukocytosis, right? They have blood on labs, all these things are telling me epidemic time, right? Yeah, for sure. Awesome. Uh -huh. Yes, awesome. Wait, no. Ah, I'm not hearing you so good. I don't know why. Yeah, it's really here, right? So it's drowning my voice. Mm. All right. So, when you go into the nice head, so far. Yes, sir, I did. Yes. Uh, uh, most likely complication from epiglottitis is what? Most likely complication. It's going to be respiratory failure, right? In the epiglottis, it's going to it's going to occur the whole airway. Swollen inflamed epiglottis will close the airway, and that can lead to what respiratory failure. Yeah, respiratory failure. In now, croup is caused by what? Mm -hmm. It's called by para influenza, right? Virus. Mm -hmm. It's caused by para influenza virus, which is part of the paramixo viruses. Mm -hmm. Okay. Croup causes what? Laryngo tracheitis, right? 
viral laryngotracheitis. So the larynx is inflamed, part of the trachea will be inflamed in blue. So they have the seal like backing curve, right? Yeah. Proof. Mm -hmm. They may also have stridal. Yeah. In group. But the lungs will be fine, the pharynx will be fine, it's just yeah, laryngotracheitis. Yeah. So that is self limiting, it's gonna go away by itself. But also bacteria too can cause tracheitis. Yeah, the, the patient can have bacterial tracheitis. Yeah. Okay. But the trachea is in plain, right? But it's caused by bacteria. In that case, I must say, yes, this, uh, they might have the cough, uh, have the stridal, but then patient have with high grade fever, right? With massive leukocytosis, with a lot of neutrophils and band cells, right? In the blood, telling me it's bacterial tracheitis, not viral, right? Tracheitis. So far, so good? Yes, sir. So far, so good. Bronchitis. Right? The bronchi, the bronchi can be inflamed. Most commonly viral, but sometimes bacterial too. In bronchitis, patient where they have the cough, uh, respiratory distress, all those things, and uh, you may also hear the stridal. However, the lung is fine. So primary exam will be fine. X-ray will look normal. There will be nothing in the lung. So dealing with bronchitis. Yeah. And then we have bronchiolitis, which are the small airways now. Mm -hmm. The love testing bronchiolitis in the setting of what? RSV. So RSV causes bronchiolitis of the small yes. airways, right? Bronchial, if there's bronchiolitis and narrowing of the small airways, now that will cause a wheezing, not stridal, wheezing, because smaller airways, wheezing, that's what you're gonna hear from the scaltation of the lung. X-ray two, we just show, it might show maybe inflammation of the small airways, but the lung is fine. The lung itself will look fine. Aerated lung, there's no infiltrate in the lung. So it's not a pneumonia. Is bronchiolitis. They will be wheezing. They may have rest, uh, retractions, uh, difficulty head trapping, all those kind of things. Dilate, uh, even hyperinflated lung, but then with bronchiolitis. So a kid, typically less than two years old, more common in premature mm -hmm. babies, right? And they just mm -hmm. have cough, difficulty breathing. There's wheezing, but the X-ray looks fine otherwise. It's going to be RSV bronchiolitis. Good? Yes, sir. Now, infection in the lung, we call that what? Pneumonia. Mm -hmm. Infection in the lung, now we have pneumonia. Pneumonia, you present words, cough, shortness of breath, the physical exam will be abnormal. Because now the something is in the lung, so lung exam will be abnormal. Percussion, depending on what type of pneumonia, percussion can be abnormal, maybe dull. I can hear crackles. Repetition, which means fluid in the lung. Loud breath sound sometimes, bronchial breath sound is like lobar pneumonia, lobar consolidation, yeah. Depending on what type, but physical exam will be normal, abnormal in that case. So cough, fever, shortness of breath, and patient has an abnormal pulmonary exam. And I, I do x-ray, I'm gonna see something on x-ray now. The lungs will be filled with fluid, and that lobar fluid, consolidation. Diffuse infiltrate, interstitial infiltrate, but the, there will be something. So that doesn't the infection is where in the lung, pneumonia now. That's what I'm dealing with. Excellent. 
What are the types of pneumonia now? Types of pneumonia a can have. We have lobe, lobe pneumonia, right? Mm -hmm. We can have what? Bronco pneumonia, interstitial pneumonia, aspiration pneumonia. Yes, sir. So that's so good. Lower, yes, bronco pneumonia, interstitial pneumonia, aspiration pneumonia. Then we can put maybe something like abscess. It's not pneumonia, but let's say long abscess as the fifth category we're going to look at. Yeah. Okay. Abscess, long abscess. So, <clears> hmm. <throat> Lobar pneumonia, what does that mean? Yes. The infection is where? In the low, like in the alveolar space. That's important. The infection is where? In the alveolar space it's itself. The alveolar space are filled with what? They are filled with, not, so the bacteria colonize that in location and then neutrophils come in, fluid comes in, leads to what? A semi-solid consolidation, right? In the Low in the low, affecting a particular low. Lobes are separated by what? By scepter. Yes. So that's why lobar pneumonia will not cross. The scepter is going to be confined to just one low. However, alveolar sacs are connected within a low. So within a low, alveolar sacs are connected by what we call them pores of corn, K O H N. There are structures called pores of corn that will in connect the alveolar spaces, right, in a lobe. So that's why if yes. an infection starts with one alveolar space, it can spread a pores because the can spread, right, to the, another um, sac, another sac, until the whole lobe is affected. But yes. each lobe is affected by what? By septor. So the infection will be confined to what? The lobe, but will not cross to another lobe. So we call that lobar pneumonia. Yes, sir. In lobar pneumonia, physical exam, because we have the concentration in the lung, of course, the breath sound in that location will, will be loud, bronchial breath sound, because semi-solid, solid, as well as liquid, they are better conductors of sound than air. So if a whole lobe is filled with fluid, not air, that will conduct sound better. So the breath sound will be loud and harsh. Bronchial breath sound, lobar pneumonia. Dull percussion notes, because now there's no air there, right? Dull percussion notes, lobar pneumonia. You may also hear crackles and stuff because of fluid in there. All right. Will the cough in lobar pneumonia be productive cough or dry cough? When somebody calls, what do they bring up? Whatever somebody brings up when they call, what where is it coming from? Somebody expectorates something, right? When they yes. call, where is the where are those things coming from? When you say productive call, what are they producing? And where where are those things coming from? And it goes from the lung, from the air. From the what? The mucus from the airway. Airway, what else? Mm. What opens into the airway? The alveolar sacs open into the airway. Okay. Yes, the alveolar sacs in the lung, they open where? Into the airway, right? Airway. Mm -hmm. So if somebody has a lobar pneumonia, would they produce, is it even a productive cough or dry cough? Productive cough. Productive cough. Mm -hmm. cough. What is the most common cause of lobar pneumonia? Uh, strep pneumo. Strep pneumo. It's common. Yes. Strep pneumo. For community acquired lobar pneumonia, strep pneumo is the most common. Right. So that's so good. 
Yes. In patients that are immunocompromised, right? Yes. Now, you try to strep pneumo, there's risk for what? Other bugs like what? TB, tuberculosis can cause lobar pneumonia. Yes, in a compromised patient. Mm -hmm. TB can. Okay. TB can. Yes. So in that case now, I cannot have things like what? Chronic pneumonia. It's going to be acute. It's going to be chronic. It's something they have for months. Something that accompanies by severe weight loss, spiking fever chills, night sweats, bloody sputum. <laughs> right. Yes, those are going to be things. That, and then I take WBC. Instead of seeing neutrophils, uh, uh, panther, you see what? Lymphocytes. They are taking likely, right? And patient has HIV or AIDS, think likely TB, right? In that case, not uh, strep anymore. Okay. Lobar pneumonia is going to be caused by, by fungi. There are some fungus that can cause liver pneumonia, toxinodes, mm -hmm. blastomycosis, histoplasmosis. We call them endemic, right? Mycotic infections. In other words, they are endemic to certain locations. And the thing with those endemic fungi infections, are they can mimic TB in presentation. They mimic TB. Chronic pneumonia with weight loss, sometimes bloody sputum, Night sweat, you're going to see Isla Lipalinopathy, right? Just like TB. But then they cannot tell you that the patient, either, they're going to give you additional clues to tell them apart. One clue is patient is not immunocompromised. Patient doesn't have HIV, doesn't have AIDS, they're not transplant patient. So you're thinking likely not TB. They're not coming from endemic areas where TB is common. They've, they've never traveled out of the US. So you're thinking likely not TB. But they're going to tell you the patient is in an area where those fungus are common or they, they have risk factors for exposure to those the spores of those fungi. We're looking at what somebody like lives in what, maybe the south um, western United States, the desert region, where um, uh, coccidiodomycosis, right, is common. Texas and co, those areas. Or a patient that lives in well, uh, around the um, Mississippi, Ohio River, right? Basin, central and northern part of, not western, uh, not eastern part of the US, central part of the US, right? That's histoplasma blastomycosis. Patients for histoplasma too, cave exploration is a national risk factor. Cave exploration. Recently went camping. Yeah, right. You suspect those endemic mycosis. Yeah. Or they can give you histology. We we'll get sputum sample, or we get bronchiolar lavage or uh, uh, lymph node biopsy, and we see what acid fast bacilli with caseous granuloma TB. We see yeast in macrophages or body yeast, right? Fungi. Yeast. Awesome. Yes, okay. awesome. Loba pneumonia. And don't forget that what those causes of fungal pneumonia, the endemic mycosis, they can disseminate. They can live the lung, just like TB can. <laughs> so yeah. TB2 can live the lung and go everywhere. Uh, uh, brain, spleen, liver, it is disseminate. Those guys too can disseminate. Histoplasma can go to the liver and spleen and bone marrow. Coxidiodomycosis can go to the what? To the skin, to the bone. Uh, sorry, sorry, to the to the bone and the brain, brain, bone, stuff, coccidio. Blastomycosis, skin, bone, B for bone, B for blasto, can also go to the skin, goes to the what, to the uh, gentle united tract, bladder and stuff, kidneys for blastomycosis. So they can also disseminate. They are more likely to disseminate in what, in immunocompromised patient, right? Than in people that are what, in the complex, yeah. Yes, sir. And in all of them, you're going to be aggressive granuloma. So all of them, they both have lab granuloma. So you have to look at risk factors, where is patient live, and things like that. Do we see acid fast bacilli or not, right? Or we see yeast on histology, right? To so kind of confirm for sure which one we deal with. And TB will not go to the skin, right? So I'm saying maybe skin involvement, uh, likely not TB. Yeah, but TB can also go to other locations. All right. Super, so good.
Yes, that's okay. That's lobar pneumonia. Next on our list is what? Bronco pneumonia. Bronco pneumonia is a pneumonia where what? The organism is colonizing the, from the name, the airwaves. Broncos. Broncos, bronchioles. Not the alveolar sac or species. Bronco pneumonia. In bronco pneumonia too, the cough in the world, productive, <laughs> right? Yes. Yes, sir. And I'm going to hear crackles in the lung. Crackles, decreased breast sanity, you see. But then on x ray, what will you see? Scattered infiltrates, not lobe infiltrate. I won't see like a whole lobe that is just white. I'm going to see like marks and dots, scattered infiltrates, right? In the lung. Broken pneumonia, but they have productive cough. They look sick, very sick. The bugs that cause lobar pneumonia can also cause bronco pneumonia. <laughs> the bugs that cause lobar pneumonia can also cause bronco pneumonia pattern. In addition to that, they also have things like what mufilus influenza can cause bronco pneumonia, especially in those that are unvaccinated. Klebsiella pneumonia. Especially in those that what that have that are colleagues, uh, yeah. And if you see bronco pneumonia all over the with what current jelly sputum tick, current jelly sputum likely what clefsiella, right? Common in our colleagues, right? Yeah. Right. So that's bronco pneumonia. In interstitial pneumonia, where's the colonization from the name in the interstitial? The spaces between what? The alveolar spaces, the alveolar sacs. Interstitial, the lung. Hence, interstitial pneumonia. Will interstitial pneumonia cough be productive? Big no. Which makes sense. Where, where is the concentration of interstitial? Outside the sac, outside the airway. So if they cough, there's nothing, they, they're going to bring up nothing. Dry cough. Yes, Dry cough, shortness of breath, fever. I do my lung exam. I'm hearing what? Crackles. It's in that shell. Crackles, crepitus. Crepitations. Crackles. I check x ray. I see the infiltrates, diffuse scattered infiltrates, interstitial infiltrates, interstitial pneumonia. So you can see that bronco pneumonia almost look like interstitial, right? In terms of infiltrate, x rays finding will be the same, but guess what? Productive cough in bronco pneumonia. Interstitial pneumonia, dry cough. So that's again? Yes, sir. What can cause interstitial pneumonia now? Organisms. Bacteria wise, we are dealing with what? We are dealing with mycoplasma. It's because. Mycoplasma pneumonia is the one that causes the walking pneumonia, right? Where these people, they actually, what they, they are not that sick. They don't feel that sick. They are still walking around. Mm -hmm. They are going to work. But then you check their x ray, right? you're going to shout. You are really, really mm -hmm. sick. But they look healthy or not that sick. Sometimes physical exam will be all remarkable. But then we do x ray, we see all this restraint in the lung. Oh my God, you are sick, right? Mycoplasma. Yes, Mycopl Another way to tell if somebody has mycoplasma pneumonia is that mycoplasma can also cause what upper respiratory tract infection. It can cause pharyngitis, it can cause sinusitis. So imagine somebody telling you that in addition to the pneumonia, they also have sore throat, <laughs> likely mycoplasma. Because most of the other causes of pneumonia, they only cause pneumonia, they don't cause upper respiratory, it's like bacteria, they don't cause both. Yeah, so young uh, college students or you know young adults uh, doesn't feel that sick. They just have this cough. If they, they don't feel that sick. They are still going to work. It is walking around, and they are. They tell you they also have sore throat and stuff, likely mycoplasma. They check the X-ray. See if that interstitial infiltrate or uh, the scattered infiltrate, mycoplasma. The same pneumonia compact mycoplasma. Mycoplasma is unique. 
structurally, right, it has no cell wall. Yes. Right? It only has a cell membrane. Why is that significant? It's significant because we cannot use cell wall synthesis in a bitterus to treat mycoplasma. It is naturally immune against penicillins, bank, cephalosporins. The PNEPs is naturally immune. So that's why we have these words, um, macrolides, tetracyclines, protein synthesis inhibitors, right, to treat mycoplasma. Yes. That's one. Two, mycoplasma as a cell membrane, which is what? Similar to, do our cells have cell membrane? Of course they do. Yes. So the immune system will not see mycoplasma as foreign. Like it sees it as foreign, but it's not gonna respond too much compared to a bacteria that has maybe like a cell wall or has a toxin that the immune system has never seen before. That's why the immune response to mycoplasma is mild. They don't feel that sick. The immune system, because it has a cell wall, so it's like a camouflage, right? You see, it's not a cell wall. We won't see it as foreign that much. So the immune system response is mild. It's more, it's not that bad. Mycoplasma. They barely make exudates. They nothing. Just. And then, Michael, and because of that, right? So immune system, if immune system responds, that's how we respond to mycoplasma anyway. I will make antibodies against the cell membrane. Those antibodies can start cross-reacting with what? With red blood cells. Because red blood cells, they can share, they share antigens with mycoplasma. Another example of what? Molecular mimicry. That is why mycoplasma is associated with what? With IgM autoimmune hemolytic anemia. So we make IgM against mycoplasma, and then guess what? Those antibodies will start cross-reacting with what? With red blood cells and start destroying red blood cells and lead to what? Hemolytic anemia. M for mycoplasma, M for IgM. Yeah, autoimmune hemolytic anemia. Cold agglutinins, right? Yes, sir. Other causes of interstitial pneumonia we should know includes what? It includes chlamydophila cetaceae. Chlamydophila cetaceae, P S I T A S I, I think T T A S I. Yeah, cetaceae. Oh, the bird one, man. The bird one, right. Okay, okay. The bird one, yeah. Actually, with fancy birds, parrots, and co. How would I separate, differentiate chlamydophila cetaceae pneumonia from other causes of interstitial pneumonia? These guys also cause what? Cetaceae also causes. Um, ah, how do I tell you that part? There's something that causes specific. I think liver. I'm not sure, you know. I think liver. Besides the risk factor of, okay, patient has fancy beds and whatnot, I think cetaceae also affects the liver. Yeah. So if you see pneumonia plus evidence of liver damage, right, also, patient has jaundice, elevated liver enzymes, right, likely, and uh, patient has a, a fancy bird exposure, likely cetaceae. Yeah. Okay. Then there's Q fever. Q fever, which is coxella bonetti. Q fever, did you get the cetaceae? Yes, sir. Q fever, coxella bonetti. Coxella bonetti, right? I share with what? With uh, uh, having a farm, right? Same usually in farmers or people exposed to what? Farm animals, right? Like calves, actually calves, I think. Calves, sheep and stuff. Yeah, calves, yes, sheep. Sir. Yeah, coxella benetti is a risk factor for that. Also, vets can get it. Veterinarians can get it. They're taking care of those farm animals. They can get coxella bonetti. Mm -hmm. Coxella bonetti is transmitted through spores. Yeah, and it's an atypical boy. You won't see anything on sputum culture or whatever. You won't see anything. It doesn't grab stain. It's transmitted through spores. 
and risk factors include exposure to farm animals and also affects what the liver. So in tertiary pneumonia, they are going to have what liver damage and they have fever, persistent fever, as the name key fever, oxyella bonetti. So that's good. Yes, sir. Chlamydophila pneumonia. There's another species of chlamydia called chlamydophila pneumonia. That too can look like mycoplasma pneumonia. Yeah, also because it's typical pneumonia, also seen in young adults and stuff. Um, then viruses are typically what? Interstitial, right? Pneumonia. Viruses, right? Um, influenza virus can cause pneumonia. Somebody has a flu and then now they present with pneumonia after the social pneumonia. Post-viral pneumonia can be complicated by also somebody has a flu and now they have pneumonia. It can, it can be, if it's bacterial, strep pneumonia and what's staph for you. Strep pneumonia being the most common, which can be either lobal bronchial pneumonia. Staph virus can cause post-viral pneumonia. Yeah. But virus itself, influenza itself can also cause pneumonia in the lung, which would be interstitial pneumonia. Right, so somebody has a flu, now they have pneumonia. If, if it's bacterial, they have high grade fever, neutrophils is high in the blood, band cells high in the blood, they're taking this bacterial pneumonia, is it either going to be strep pneumonia or staph aureus? Okay. But if they have, somebody has a flu, and now they're presented with pneumonia, and it's interstitial. You see the x ray, it looks interstitial pattern, they have dry cough. Patient has what lymphocytes in the blood, not neutrophils and co. Likely is the virus itself, influenza, right? That's causing the pneumonia. Yeah. Okay. Good. Well, viral pneumonia is typically interstitial pneumonia, viruses. The, the virus, the virus you're taking of the, 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 the um, surrounding circumstance will give you a clue of the virus. If somebody has a flu now, they have viral pneumonia, it's likely the influenza virus itself. Somebody mm -hmm. is immunocompromised and they now have the same viral pneumonia, CMV <laughs> pneumonia, CMV. Somebody has, uh, somebody no compromise, AIDS patient, now they're having what pneumonia, like a cryptococcus, neophoma. Yes, patient has AIDS, less than 200, and they're having pneumonia, very, very sick, PCP, here, than that one. Interstitial mm -hmm. pneumonia also, but it looks very, 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 very bad. Hypoxemia, they are cyanotic, PCP, right? It's patient. So different bugs based on the risk factors. You know, compromise LD, right? Young, those like that. So you just put it together. You're going to be thinking, okay, most likely, right? Will be that, that, yeah. So that's interstitial. Aspiration pneumonia. What would be the mechanism of aspiration or risk factor? Aspiration pneumonia. Mm -hmm. Yeah, alcoholic. Alcoholism, right? Yes. Alcoholism, stroke, yeah. neuromuscular junction disease. You have somebody that anything that leads to what sinus suppression, weakness of the what, pharyngeal muscles, and uh, right, and yeah, those things can cause what dysphagia, aspiration, yeah, and increases for aspiration pneumonia. Okay. Where will aspiration pneumonia be located in the lung? Mm -hmm. That will be for me. Hmm? If a patient aspirates while upright, where will be the infection? Base of the lung. Yes, yes. Left or right, most likely. Right. Why? It's more, it's shorter and it's more. It's more vertical, more vertical yes. and shorter, and and more vertical and wider in diameter. So likely right. Okay. If a patient has raised while they are lying back, where, lying on their back, supine, where would the pneumonia be? Also, it can be at the base. It can also be what at the middle lobe on the right side. It can be at the base of the word upper lobe because those are going to be the dependent area, right? If I'm lying down flat, but if I'm sitting up when the patient aspirates, 
definitely going to be the base. More likely, the right, or most likely, right, more common on the right than the left because of the another one. Yeah, but it can also be on the yeah. left too. Yeah, okay. So location user is one clue to knowing this aspiration pneumonia. Also, because aspiration pneumonia is usually what mixed flora, mixed, which includes anaerobes as well as what gram negative, right, enterics in the oral cavity. There's gonna be what they usually lead to what abscess. So I'm gonna say what air feed level, right? You look at the consolidation in the lung that has what cavitations or hair feed level, yeah, or, right? Or patients also have like chills, spiking fever, chills, likely aspiration. Anaerobic infection is accompanied by what foul smelling sputum. That's another clue to tell me this likely anaerobes. Nasty, fast smelling sputum. Unlike the other bugs we discussed so far, it's not fast smelling. Anaerobes, fast smelling sputum. Yes. Excellent. Yes. And it's important to know that this aspiration pneumonia because our treatment will be different. Right, whereas we can use uh, subtractions, we can use uh, macrolides, um, glycosides, uh, penicillins, beta lactam antibiotics to treat most of the other pneumonias we've mentioned, except, of course, the uh, fungal, you use antifungal for PCP using TMPSMX, uh, for cryptococcus uh, using antifungal, right, except some special circumstances. For aspiration pneumonia, we're using what? Ant uh, antibiotics that uncover what? Anaerobes, clindamycin, yeah. Clindamycin would be appropriate, or use what ampicillin. Ampicillin is going to cover anaerobes. Ampicillin, clindamycin. Yeah. That's what we use to treat aspiration pneumonia. Also, abscess. Yeah. So, abscess, we just talked about abscess can be this word aspiration, right? Mm -hmm. Pneumonia. Also, we can see abscesses in what? In conditions like bronchiectasis. Yeah, we may see abscess in bronchiectasis. Yeah, we may see that. Usually at the base of the lung also, or it's going to be located somewhere other than the base, apex, middle lobe, whatever, uh, recurrent infection, uh, recurrent episodes, maybe related to bronchiectasis. Um, abscesses can also be what, transmitted hematogenously to the lung. Okay. How, right, so a patient has a bacteria in the blood, the blood carries right to the lung. In that case, the abscess will be what, located not only on the base, right? Everywhere in the lung, upper, low, middle, low, every diffuse cavities or cavity lesions or nodules. Yeah. And in that case, you're going to think of the so risk factors for that we what? Somebody has what? Some sort of uh, some people with um, um, some, somebody with uh, thrombophlebitis, where there's a thrombus in the veins. We superimpose infection. If the infection is anaerobe, it can disseminate to the lung, right? And lead to lung abscess. Patients with mm -hmm. right ventricular and right sided infective endocarditis, tricuspid endocarditis, pulmonic endocarditis, right? The bulk can disseminate, right, from the right side to where to the pulmonary artery, end up in the lungs, right? And lead to what? Pulmonary abscess, yeah. Yes, sir. Excellent. Yes. Okay. So that's absent. Any questions? Um, not really, though. Mm -hmm. That's a lot of food for thought, right? Oh, that is one question. What's the difference between bronchiectasis and the others? Bronchiectasis and? And the others are like bronchitis. No, well, bronchitis is a word, ob ob uh, obstructive lung disease. Okay. These people, from the name bronchiectasis, the bronchus is dilated, ectasia. So the mechanism of bronchitis is what there's a, there'll be there are two mechanisms. First of all, there's an obstruction. Okay. There's an obstruction. There's gonna be an obstruction in the airways, like the bronchus or the bronchioles. There'll be an obstruction in the airway, 
would superimpose what? Infection. Mm -hmm. So they're going to pressure in the airways, we superimpose infection. So these people have what? They have a risk factor for obstruction of the airway. They're going to have a risk factor for what? Infection <laughs> of the airway. Okay. So you're going to see pregnancy what? Condition like cystic fibrosis. There's mucus plug, which also serves as the igniters for what? Bacteria proliferation. Okay. People uh, like uh, people that are immunocompromised, AIDS patients, people that have primary immunodeficiency, they're prone to recurrent infections. Mm -hmm. And the bugs that are implicated here are bugs that what? That cause necrotizing pneumonia, necrotizing infection. In other words, they can kill and destroy, right? The epithelial lining, right, of the airways. Okay. Which includes staph aureus, pseudomonas, aspergillus, fumigatus. Staph aureus, pseudomonas, aspergillus. Those are the bugs that are implicated in bronchiectasis. Yeah, they are necrotizing bugs. Okay. So what happens to the wall of the airways? The wall of the airways gets what? Weak? Thin and it's going to what dilate. Right. So, on x ray, on x ray, and see this kind of the chest or what now, what will you see? Thickened wall, thickened dilated airways, thickened dilated airways, thickened dilated airways. Hence the name bronchiectasis. So, the presentation will be a mixture of what? Obstruction, wheezing, stridal, turns of breath. ETC, you may see hyperinflated lung a little bit because of air trapping and infection, cough, sometimes blood sputum, necrotizing infection, and um, uh, consolidation in the lungs. You may see on x ray, you can see infiltrates in the lungs and stuff, yeah, in those patients, yeah. So a mixture of both obstruction and superimposed infection. The sputum will be what? Purulent. Purulent sputum. If it's caused by anaerobes, fast smelling, but typically not anaerobic bug, so it's not fast smelling, but it's going to be pure lens putting, yeah, that they're going to have. If you contrast that with what chronic bronchitis, bronchitis have what they have cough, sputum, but it's not pure lens because it's not an infection; it's just an obstruction because of bronchorea, but they don't have a superimposed infection per se. It's smoking, right? Chronic bronchitis, smoking prevents what clearance of the airway. So airway irritation, they have cough and sputum production, but sputum is what? It's non-purulent sputum. There's not infection, there's no infection there. Yeah. Okay. But bronchiectasis, you see risk factors for obstruction and infection, cystic fibrosis, uh, primary dyskinesia, dyskinesia, no compromised state. They have having recurrent episodes of what? Of infection mm -hmm. over time. We check the x-ray, we see ticking dilated airways. You do CT scan, ticking dilated airways, bronchiectasis. Yes. All right, good. Mm -hmm. Yes. So practice some questions on respiratory farm and um, Respiratory farm and um, what's it called? Micro, yeah. Mm -hmm. Respiratory micro, right? And um, yes, there are some questions on that. Yeah, I try to also complete the other objectives as best as we can. All right, doctor. I'll see you tomorrow. Yes, sir. All right. Are you able to leave home today? Yes, I can marry my brother. Okay. All right, as much as I can, and uh, yeah, all right. So I'll see you tomorrow again. And yes, um, enjoy. I will. Thank all you, right. No problem. Bye. I know.